if uh, the audience would like to ask any questions, please write them now in the chat and we will convene them to the uh, guests. <clears throat> and in the meantime, um, just to conclude, um, the three lectures examine the interrelations between scale and matter in architecture. Um, the various meanings of scale, as we have heard, are derived from the capacities of the human hand and the material it has learned to shape through the years, exhibited in the work of uh, Professor Kondu. Two abstract mathematical notions of grouping and information theory demonstrated in the work of Louis Kahn by Michael Benedict. And uh, lastly, as a frame of reference that sheds light on contemporary developments in architecture through the works of uh, from antiquity. Um, we will now pose a few questions um, to the speakers and collect the questions from the audience. Karen Lee. Thank you, Tom, and thank you uh, to our speakers. Uh, while we gather questions on the chat, please uh, feel free to start writing them. Uh, we have a question that we would like to address to the three of you and hear what you, uh, how you respond to it. So linguistically, scale can be regarded both as a noun and as a verb. Uh, Professor Lederbar just recently alluded to that while speaking about scale as a process. Uh, each of your talks has expanded, uh, we think, a certain definition or notion of scale uh, as a noun, and we, uh, we would love to hear what you think, how would that notion um, and the related methods and tools uh, derived from it be impacted if we were to look at scale as a verb? Um, I think uh, that um, the, the fact that it's a verb and a noun, it's almost the same thing because uh, architecture is not only the product, it's the production, it's the process. Um, uh, not only does our habitat evolve, also the human being evolves and grows from the time we are a baby to going through the different sizes we occupy in rooms. And um, uh, so, so there is the immediacy of what we can touch. First, it begins with the mouth, you know, when the baby's world is related to that. And then it's to how much they can then see. And by seeing, even like, I remember when I used to take my son when he was about four to the park or three, he wouldn't want to see those in a zoo, see the giraffe. He would just see the immediate blades of grass around him. And if there was an insect or something. So even if we occupy and can physically see the sky, we don't actually colonize more than we, depending on our consciousness, I think, and awareness. So there is also this aspect. Um, and I think, therefore, it's it has a, the, the sense of, how we colonize our space when we occupy it has again a whole lot of ranges like a child could you could be living in a palace or in a large home and occupy a corner when you're a baby in your mind you know and when you come back to that spot later you'll see the whole scale different not only because of how much you occupy which is varying but how much you actually perceive or how you see the world and the world view. And I think therefore I really, I must say I thoroughly enjoyed both the other presentations. And I just like the way it all complemented each other. And I really love the way, you know, when David brought, picked up on this point of, um, you know, the, the, you mentioned the collectives because as our relationships increase, we occupy the world globally too. And it's, it's, it's endless when we sit and, you know, once we've made the journey to the moon or even before that, only visually, how do we see ourselves contextually and look at what you occupy? It's we live in our minds and the perception affects the physical occupation of a space and how it is then informed. So I think that the fact that there are a society in evolution and the fact that the individual is evolving through their life and through the relationships and collectively, you know, how we, we feel at home in the in the entire cities, if they were our root, if our roots are there, as opposed to when you may live in a very neutral city where you don't feel rooted, then you might only hover between your home and a 
uh, uh, an office and occupy only those spaces. So I think because it is so much more about process than the product, therefore the verb is more uh, the verb than the actual physical thing because the very fact that there is an interpretation going on. And I, I must, I would want to mention also one other thing about, um, you know, um, Professor Benedict's presentation, which I really enjoyed this, you know, when you look at modern landscapes, and I talked about industrial production. The fact that if you have a house with uh, eight or 10 windows that you have, you organize for them to work in the interior and exterior, and then you build a large facade or a certain, you know, machine produced housing. But also if you just have the same thing that works for one, uh, you know, say a 10 meter stretch, if it is beautifully solved and you apply it on a hundred meter stretch or a thousand, it's going to be oppressive. So the repetition and the numbering, this aspect, I really, really enjoyed it. That is also a very big problem of our time. So even if the single cell is known, the totality becomes anonymous when you see the modern facades and why we feel disoriented and lost. So there's so many of these, how it affects our health, happiness, and well being. It's about if we feel engaged and if we feel at home. And that's, it's about familiarity and therefore it's about process and then it becomes a verb. Thank you, um, gosh. <clears throat> I'd say for, for me, looking at the word scale, I was a little surprised when David pointed out that scaling is also means climbing, uh, you know, scaling a mountain and so forth. And I was reminded of the phrase, uh, scala natura. The, the scale of nature with a God at the top, uh, you know, angels, humans, animals, plants, dirt, rocks. So there was, you know, there's a kind of a hierarchy of consciousness of complexity, which was called scala natura. Uh, and it was assumed that one would try to climb it as animals, right? It's, it's a sort of a sense of evolution in it um, as a, ascent ascent towards uh, God um, or towards perfection or something. So I think the, that sense of scale is interesting and I'm not sure that any of us really mapped that very well. Um, but what, what we did map was the sense of, uh, which uh, Anupama just mentioned. I love the example of the child who will, you know, really look at the local uh, and not look up very much, right? And that, to think about, um, there is uh, in Isovis theory, there's a sense, there's a, a, a theory that says that one is always surrounded by rings in a way, rings of closeness. So the, the clothes on your body, the furniture around you, the room you're in, uh, the porch you look out of, the garden the porch looks into, the, you know, the, and so forth. And the requirement that wherever you are, you can see through to all of them. So you can, you know, you can look at your hand, if you will, or your table, look up and see the distant hills, uh, not in one shot as out of an airplane window or a high rise, but through gradations. That is, you can actually see the levels of enclosure, you know, opening up cracks. And there are mathematical ways to actually see whether that's happening. So when I mentioned uh, occlusivity earlier, um, there are actual ways to quantify that and to study it and to insist uh, that it be there. <clears throat> and it's come up quite practically in a project I'm doing on uh, the hospital room design, where they've shown that people in hospital rooms that can see nature uh, heal much faster uh, and leave the hospital sooner. And the question is why? you know, like, why don't you just put a potted plant in the room? It's just as good. Well, it's turning out that it's not that. You actually have to see life outside your window. And you have to see the cycle of the day outside your window. And you have to know where you are in the city. And you have to actually be oriented with respect to your room, the building, the, guard, the outdoors, the street, the city, and all the rest of it. And that sense of orientation is actually what is the healing, doing the healing 
not the view of a tree, you know, or the view of a bird or whatever. Um, so I think that there are really practical implications for that. And to map that onto Scala Natura is very interesting because now it depends if you're always the center of the universe, then you have levels of remoteness or scale around you. Um, and Anna Puma, you was sort of saying that as you get older, that circle enlarges. But I do wonder phenomenologically if that doesn't sort of stop at around 100 feet, 200 feet, something like that. You can actually look at what people look at, you know, and you can put a horizon around it. Because in space syntax, for example, you've got to, distant views don't, don't matter a whole lot. But I've spoken too much, uh, David. Very briefly, I think, um, uh, I tend to think of architects in scale terms, I have to admit. I think, uh, I think Scarpa is, is one to 10, maybe <laughs> one to one. I think that Khan uh, at his best, he's most at home at one to 100. I think Corbusier is one to 200. I, th I think Anupama is one to one. Uh, I, 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 I just have to put you among your colleagues, Anu. Um, it's not that it's not that Khan didn't have a sense of one to one or one to ten. He just seems to me fluid at one to one hundred. And I believe, in terms of process, people habituate themselves to seeing in one scale or another. I actually think architecture is thought in scales, yeah. and I know many bad designs that have been designed as one to 200 at the detail scale. Mm -hmm. And this um, inability to be sensitive to the requirement of the scale itself, um, I think is, is something we have to be sensitive yeah. to. And it, it, it alludes to what has been said about things that are really big, but lack scale. Uh, this is an issue for us today. And the kind of thinking that is required at one scale or another is, I believe, uh, something teachers need to be sensitive to and help students understand. Because generally speaking, in architecture schools, what one sees is one to 200 or maybe one to 100 work, and that's it. Not one to 500, not to one 1,000, nor one to one, nor one to 10. And I think they are different kinds of thinking and different possibilities of thought at different scales. So the process of scaling thought or the thought at scale um, is a, a, a topic that I think um, we, could, we could profit from reflecting on. Uh, may I please add something to that, David, if you're finished? Please, please, please. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought this up because there's something I often wanted to discuss in the digital age is the fact that, you know, when, uh, when we imagined buildings or we were taught architecture in my times too, we were taught, we used scales, uh, different scales. There was, a, there was a language in the profession that you did Many architects first did the one to 500, then the 100, then the two, you know, as you, you had to, because in certain scales, certain things would appear and they could be only tackled in that scale. And some very detailed machinery would have to be doubled its size to be seen because of the scale at which you can perceive and understand the voids between things and so on. So we had a certain language and we knew that for working something out, we worked on a specific scale. Like we would do doors and windows in one to 10. And we were used to reading any printout of any student because everybody knew when they switched to a different uh, detail, so we, we, we saw print out and we knew what it was. Mm -hmm. And now I feel the very fact that the students can zoom, just that one function of zoom, I feel like taking it out of all computers <laughs> because I just feel, because they zoom, I want to know what would happen to every student if they weren't drawing on the same drawing and just zooming around and they enlarge arbitrarily. So you never know, has they, have they oh, to put in too much information for that scale? Mm -hmm. instead of making another drawing or should they have made 
uh, or the drawings look under um, uh, under informed in informative, <laughs> and then they would they keep on zooming it, and when they print it out, when the uh, submission is appearing, that's when they realize. But we realize it already before, and we have created a culture, and I haven't heard it being talked about anywhere. To just in a, it's a whole another universe when you look into that scale and therefore people are using weird numbers and nobody we knew like we knew that when you see a drawing i know if it's not the scale it's the next one and i can in, without dimension i can read it mm -hmm. i know how to like in a bonsai reduce my human size to occupy that drawing and be in it but now nobody knows anything anymore and i think this is a grave problem and i'm not finding a forum for that. So I'm so glad that you raised this. Good. Ed Nicole. There's a, there's a thought that um, in the future, because you know the computer stores a building as basically lines and surfaces, that it's um, it's it's fairly trivial actually to um, sort all the elements in the digital model into scale into scaled elements. And that would be able to, you'd be able to have a slider on your screen with, with two brackets. Show me everything that's three feet and smaller, nothing else. Show me everything between five feet and 20 feet, nothing else. So you would have a scale window. And if you move that scale window, your building would be shown in section, but it would not be a spatial section. It would be a scale section. So at small scales, you'd see a million little things floating around. And at large scales, all the middle little things would disappear and only the big things would be there. And it would be, right? And it, you could say it's a little bit like uh, radio stations on a dial. Like at, at, at points on the dial, there's, there's music. There's different music playing at different, at different scales. So, you know, my hope, uh, Anupama, is that actually the programmers of uh, of our software will will stumble upon this and uh, and uh, put it in. I think Edna had a point. Yeah, Edna. <laughs> and I had a finger. Um, hi. I wonder if it's not just measurable. And as I start to say, even from uh, Pascal, uh, that was a mathematician that understand that talking about counting is talking about kind of relationship between things. And uh, you all mention it. And I think that what I feel that we need to teach our students or talk about is what kind of relationship they think uh, will hold, what measure will hold their relationship, the relationship they, they want to achieve. And I think this is one of the things that we're not really, it's not just details, is uh, is not just that into one to 100, you need this kind of details. And because of the computer, basically it's one to one, you just zoom in out. So you have all the details all the time. But I think it's uh, talking about what kind of relationship we want to achieve. And you all spoke about the relationship inside the building, the relationship between things outside the building, the relationship between humans, the relationship of creation, things with your hand. So I think this is something that um, we need to think about it when, and, and especially, um, I think I like the idea that Michael showed that usually we look at the building that you said, and he said, this is a huge scale, it's not a human scale. It's not because it's not a human scale, still human made it. It's because it's one, it doesn't have any relationship. This is the point. And I think this is something that we need to uh, ponder a little bit of what kind of relationship we want. We don't really talk about it. We just talk about like making a place and things like this, this is a relationship between things, it's scale. Yeah, if I might say, I, do, I think the theory of a, a kind of a relational theory of architecture uh, has yet to be devised. I, I think we do have a vocabulary. Uh, it's not like no one's ever thought about relation, clearly. Um, but I, 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 don't, I think we've reached the limit of what can be said by combining old ideas in different ways. 
I think there needs to be new variables, new tools, new software, new vocabulary. We have to give ourselves more to think about than, you know, than going over and over the same sort of ground. I do know, um, and if you read my book, maybe, maybe it'll help do that a little bit. I'm trying, I'm trying. But um, it comes up, what you're saying comes up for me as a teacher very often. You know, if you go around my town, maybe in Israel as well, uh, we do housing blocks, which repeat a certain element, as Anna Palmer said, uh, and, and the end walls are blank. And the end walls are blank because that is a typical unit, is a party wall with no openings. And the, the, the architect or the developer doesn't come back and say, you know what, the end units are different to the units that are in the middle. And the end units can have windows all the way around. And not only are the end units different, the middle unit is different because you know it's in the middle. And the back is different to the front. And the third of the way from the stair is different to a quarter. You know, in other words, you go back in and differentiate. You start with a repetitive system, and then you go around and in a certain way apologize to everything that you assumed was identical and said, I understand your specialness, and here's what we're going to do. I understand your specialness, and so forth. So you, you revisit the things that counting destroyed, because counting is always destructive. The minute you make a number, the minute you count and group, you're throwing away half the attributes, which are the things that are not uh, counted, you know? And I think Khan would often do that. You make a system and then you go back and look for differences and then amplify the differences in the counting. Yeah. I think this is a very interesting point for the future uh, of uh, high density buildings because the same comes to the grid, the question of the grid. When you have to repeat, you find the commonality and then one has to, that's what is interesting in the Le Corbusier buildings as compared to the Plattenbau and other ones that didn't have his artistic judgment to break or compose within the monotony of the repetition to release it from its oppression through color or devices or, you know, even, even not only on the end walls. In fact, um, I, have, uh, uh, I have written this book, you know, of Roger Angers, who was practicing in Paris at the same time. And he's done, I would recommend this to everyone. My, all my studies are exactly about how to work in, with the fact that the future is going to be about high density and repetition and how to bring that uniqueness and make it go beyond its, you know, uh, in, in, in traditional architecture, the craftsmanship saved the show and the textures, what they did around windows and ornamentation. So what is going to be the new strategy for the fact that we are going to build bigger, longer buildings and so on. And, and you know, I would uh, strongly suggest, you know, that, you know, to, to look at how to define and how to, you know, handmade and machine made can both become oppressive if this idea of repetition, you know, the so many numbers are making it become faceless. You know, I just really loved all your inputs because I think uh, all the, 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 it just shows that the topic you chose for this mm -hmm. is so That's relevant for the future. Yeah. So rich. Okay. Um, so please, Anna. So, First thing, so first thank you. Uh, yeah, life here. goes on. <laughs> so thank you for all the three speakers. It was inspiring and um, really your knowledge and all three angles added to each other. And thank you Edna for organizing this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, conference. And also Gilly and whoever was involved. Um, it's not so much a question, but I think it's a remark and um, or a thought that came in, into mind after listening uh, to uh, Professor Kunduz's quest, uh, remark about uh, scale and about uh, drawings and about students and about the fact that it's either really a zoom in or completely a zoom out. And uh, 
I rarely do it. I usually am very fascinated by architecture itself and materiality and uh, artistic judgment and all things that sometimes in Israel we find difficulty talk, speaking about, I must say. So thank you, Edna, for, bring, for bringing it to the front. But I think it also, at least when we look in the, I'm talking now as a teacher, as a, and not as a practicing architect, but I think that there's also a very huge, a big difference um, in not only in the working tools as Professor um, uh, Kondu said, but also there is, I find that it also, it's also related to the, I'll say, cultural background or social background of the young generation, that their affiliation <laughs> is either to themselves, like a very, very microscopic way of looking at things, and like all the rest. Um, I don't know where I go to, but I think that somehow if we talk about architectural education, there is also something that has to be transmitted to the students or we should I don't, discussed with the students, they're somehow our colleagues more than students, about the circles of references to what you refer. Like where do you come as an artist that deals with his own, you know, I don't know, it's not a, it's not, the artist is not a good word because artists usually refer to other circles as well, but where do you become an independent and works on a certain product and where actually your product extends and touches the other worlds around so that first it's your own community and then it has to go with the, sit the people in the city. I'm not even talking about the city itself. And then it has a larger reference and all these, like, I think that echo also at the end in the craft. So I say I found, I find kind of like teaching, I don't know, already for many years, although I'm quite young, I think, um, I think that you, you, you see that things change within these students that come around or the children, I don't know. And, there is also this gap, I think, to, to, or to, I don't know if to close or just, you know, to understand that this is where we're going to, that there is your personal thing, and then there is the huge bunch of the others. Uh, while I feel that even one generation apart, like I'm quite close to these people, um, there was much more a gradient of references. And I think that this should also be taught in an, as well as the dealing with architecture itself. I think they are related to each other. Um, I so beautifully put, and in the many conferences I've been to, I've not heard anyone identify that particular problem, if you will. Uh, I try to in my book, Architecture Beyond Experience, where I devote a chapter to what I call uh, solipsism. Solipsism is the philo philosophical belief that one's own experience is definitive of reality. And it encourages, and this generation is very, very prone to it. Mm -hmm. And so is the entire experientialist account of architecture. Whenever people say architecture is about experience, what goes along with that is that architecture is about individual experience, as though we were all solitary tourists in the world and that the world consists of two things, me and everything else. Now, the relationship between me and everything else is not an honest uh, dialogue because everything else is not an entity. Everything else is everything that's not me, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the first step in a relational view of architecture and of life is to start with two which is you and another person, two people and another two people, community. So that's the missing levels, is the sense of, of, of not just of we, but of me and you. And then transcribed, for me, it's to transcribe 
that sense of sociality and our dependence on each other for our consciousness, we depend on each other. And to map that into the building, to ask about the relationship of this chair to that chair, this yeah. table to this room, this room to that room, this building to that building. Mm -hmm. Do they confront? Do they cooperate? Are they hostile? Are they to, to take all the human attributes um, and to uh, inject them and anthropomorphically, quite honestly, into buildings and into elements of the landscape. That's what, when I talk about onto relationality, ontos is being and relationality is relationality. So you credit everything with being, not just yourself. And I think the, the experiential take in architecture that says that it's the experience that counts is a very, very solitary view of the world. And it feeds into our solipsism. It feeds into what's in my headphones, what's on my screen, mm -hmm. what's on the TV. It's all about me and my experience. And because I'm a Democrat, it can be about you and your experience, but we're both in silos. And I think from my reading of Martin Buber and some other people, we're not silos. We are bonded to each other. And to understand that as, as a description of buildings and furniture and landscapes is a big step forward. And I call that rela a relational view of architecture. And it's underdeveloped. And I think you're absolutely right that uh, the students are not are, are being bred into a solipsistic experience oriented view of the world. I'll make a brief comment. Um, I think the chain or stairway to heaven has been broken. Um, maybe it's polarized in the two worlds um, that are now being discussed. Uh, I don't want to assume that it should or could be restored, nor do I think it's wise for us to accept the given condition as the only one possible in the coming while. Um, I do think disorientation um, and being out of scale is part of the contemporary condition. Um, for my part, uh, I think uh, work ahead means um, not renouncing the intimacy of an interior, even the logic, self-sustaining logic of a single building, nor renouncing the expectations of infrastructure planning. But urban architecture, which is not one building, but maybe a few or two at least, is a scale that um, won't overcome the solipsism and universalization of experience, but might um, give them a place to begin a, a conversation. That's not a restoration of cosmic harmony. I think that's a dream dreamt out for us. But that doesn't mean doing nothing or acquiescing to the two cultures that seem to me um, destructive, actually. So there is work to be done. And I think it is a matter of scale and the scale of, of one's thought and sense of involvement. Uh, I have a friend who said to me recently, David, I don't know how many times we've met. It's probably more than eight, but probably less than 12. <laughs> and on that basis, we've developed a very solid friendship. Although, I don't know that much about you. And it seems to me that more than eight and less than 12, that's a pretty good number for, the, for a conversation uh, among reasonably close friends. And I, I want the same in my thinking for the next decade or five years or two years, however long I have on this planet. And this business of the urban, architectural scale 
not the house, not the city system. I, I think there's work to be done here and it doesn't need to make claims about full continuity of reference, which I think is, is beyond us, way beyond us and probably oppressive in the end. Well said, well said. That scale of buildings, rooms, spaces, streets, uh, that's intermediate between the solitary building yeah. and uh, um, is where we are designed to operate. Uh, yeah, so here, here. Thank you all for these uh, such thought provoking answers. And I wish to read to you one question that has been posed on the chat by Ohad Sorek. Does the fact that all of us see the presentations on screens of different scale in relation to different sized rooms is more important to our common discussion than our shared knowledge? Is conception of size influenced or probably influenced by experience more by the conception of meaning? Ohad, if you're here, you're welcome to clarify. <laughs> no, I'm not watching on the phone, but uh, all of us have different size screens, right? So I'm watching it in a laptop, and some of you probably are watching it on a big screen, like uh, 16 inch or or larger. And we are in, I'm I'm sitting in my uh, living room, and some of you are probably in a bedroom or a library. I think it's not so much. I think uh, when we look at um, a small or a big screen, and this goes for architecture or also a Zoom and uh, interaction. I think it's not so much um, the size of the screen or the size of the image. It's it's the, what you recognize as your reference. Uh, if you see other faces, you know your mind adjusts. Uh, I think and reads that space that way. But similarly, when architecture is drawn and photographed repeatedly without people. The problem is that when we have so much information that is out there conveying architecture and they are always photographed without people and we don't see the brick size or any material clue also the, the fact that in the making of architecture also any traces of a human scale reference is often left out. So we get used to seeing forms. So, so for example, in a circular room, if it is a very small 10 foot uh, room, I would not uh, enjoy that design because I know that you can't even put in a bed, a square won't fit into the, but a very big Pantheon size collective space as a circle, it works. So we, when you don't have the basic reference for how to read a thing, and if you keep on perpetuating a culture of things you know, but you don't know the reference for it. Like when I came to Europe, I don't know uh, four degrees is how cold, what I should wear. But when I start uh, attaching a sensory information, uh, experiential information to the number, then the number has a meaning. For itself, it is nothing to me because I am not able to refer to it. And I think those issues are problematic. I'd say there are uh, analogous distances um, for the, um, the situation you describe. So the screen has, I think, a three-part structure uh, itself, its background, and my vantage. And as one changes, the other two will correspondingly. And if it's a really big screen, the distances are correspondingly greater than if a tiny screen. So my sense of scaling up and scaling down is, as I, I tried to explain, uh, a ratio of distances that are subtended by uh, a recurring event, in your case, viewing. But there are other things that architecture embodies and represents that can be larger or smaller, but the structure is relatively stable. Um, yeah, so that's how scale, my sense of how it happens. I would also add uh, one of the themes that I could not get to in my lecture, maybe raised by what you said, which is, you know, if one takes a typical speed of human movement, two or three miles per hour uh, walking, okay, um, there's a certain expected effect that that has on the speed with which the environment around you changes as you move from room to room. Very nice. And when that expectation is challenged, 
or manipulated. Uh, you know, we call it architecture. So when, um, uh, when uh, uh, Japanese gardens, you know, have to slow your pace yeah. so that the miniaturization is rescaled to seem larger. Absolutely. The reason it can seem larger is because you have been slowed down. And when you slow down, everything seems bigger. So there are strategies that architects do to make people move more slowly. I've, you know, usually large urban architecture is justified, was back through the 20s and 30s, by the speed of the movement of highways and cars. So uh, a city seen at, at, at 60 miles an hour does not have to, is a waste of detail, right? But as soon as you pedestrianize, the scale must change. So it seems as though the human mind has a certain rate of transformation and change, which it finds possible to cope with. And that's probably set by evolution. It's probably set by living in a natural world. One of the amazing things about Louis Kahn's work, um, and I would have tried to illustrate it with uh, videos of Hurva, because uh, you know Hurva has been digitally uh, simulated. Um, but it's true of all the buildings you go to with him, no matter how big the building, movement always seems visually consequential, which is to say, as you move, because his, his isovists are very broken up and you can always see several levels of enclosure at once. So when you move, there's a lot of parallax in your view. A lot of things open and close because of your movement. And that tends to make you feel effective. Like we want to feel like we're having an effect on the world and we want our own movement to be consequential. So when you're in a very open, large space, like a hangar or a very convex space with no occlusions, then your own movement is inconsequential. In a perfectly convex room, if you move a few feet, it makes no difference. You see the same, right? So to give one a sense of progress, one actually has to fracture one's isovist so that there is a, there is a, a consequence of motion. So I think a lot of scale comes from the message a building is giving you about how consequential you are. Like if you don't matter, the building will tell you and it will tell you you don't matter because moving at a constant, a certain speed. Like the definition of a monument. Yes, that you are in to a house because your motion doesn't make any difference. But I think what Khan did so beautifully was he made big buildings, but he made them so three-dimensional and so porous and so filled with breakdowns into subitizable parts, that your own being there was always consequential. Your own being was, rev was revelatory and it was always worthwhile to, to walk or to move or to sit or to rise up or what have you. Um, and that combination is really wonderful. It's hard to achieve. Friends, okay. I need to run. Yeah. Sorry, David. Now, do you want to say some concluding words before I thank everybody for being here? Sure, so, okay. I just want to thank all of the audience for joining us for this very interesting, fascinating and open, vivid discussion of scale to all of our lecturers, to uh, Professor Anupama Kondu, to Professor Michael Benedict, to Professor David Leatherborough, to Dr. Edna Langenthal that has organized this event for the past six years and for Dr. Tom Shaked and Dr. Karen Libar Sinai um, for moderating the event. Um, for me, I just wanna thank you for, for understanding scale as a way to make the world intelligible through materiality, through mathematical notions, through, uh, how did David put it, scaling through uh, reframing, I thought was really, really beautiful. And I think that if scale is a way to make the world intelligible, that uh, as human knowledge will advance and will be able to make things intellig intelligible in new ways. So maybe Michael's uh, new theory that is not just reusing the uh, existing vocabulary uh, will arise. And um, 
Thank you all for all the questions and for all the questions that remain open for our next discussion. And we thank you for coming here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for all your hard work. Judy. Thank you.